So have you reached for that turtleneck sweater yet? Bought one of the big pumpkins or bright purple mums at the stand along the road? Maybe sipped your first spice latte? It's that time of year again. As the leaves turn and we move into the flow of the school year, it's a nice time to sprinkle in a little holiday fun for Halloween. Today, I've got a whole creative buffet of options for you, and I hope you'll find a few you can't wait to surprise your students with next month. Let's talk about murder mysteries, escape rooms, spooky podcasts, creepy poetry, and more. Hey there, I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and One Pager's project-based learning and choice reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini maker space to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line, creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this, you're an innovator. And while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. Okay, first off, let's talk about Halloween writing prompts. This is such a simple tweak. Anytime you're practicing something in the month of October, whether that's sentence structure or avoiding texting language, working on some sort of punctuation or type of detail, Try making your prompt Halloween themed. Throw up a creepy picture or a funny cartoon or um, some lovely watercolor of pumpkins and ask students to write with a fall frame of mind. I've created 10 quick writing prompts for you that, that have a little Halloween spin that you can make your copy of in the show notes or you can make your own. Number two, host a murder mystery party in class. This can be such an incredibly engaging activity. Students will not have done a lot of this in class before, and it can help them work on skills like inference, interviewing, speaking, critical thinking, and even understanding what a red herring is in the world of logical fallacies. Way back when in episode 31, Amanda from Engaging and Effective shared several years worth of experience in crafting a really successful high school themed classroom murder mystery lesson. So I suggest you go back to episode 31 and check out her take on it or follow the link in the show notes to see her step-by-step walkthrough if you're interested in doing this. Just a few notes from her. She suggests writing your own script so that you can create something that's creepy, but not too creepy. Maybe you don't actually want to have it be murder mystery. Maybe you want to have it be more of a whodunit of something, you know, dicey that happens that's not actually quite that violent. And she suggests setting it in high school so that students will feel like they can really understand what's going on. It's right on their turf. Um... And then she kind of walks you through the different elements. You'll want character cards for all your different students. Everybody needs to be a different persona at the party or maybe partners together can be a persona. You might want to create a map of the area in your story so that people can kind of figure out, okay, this person was in this classroom, this person was in the gym, this person was on the stairs, and they can kind of gradually be putting together the pieces of the puzzle. And maybe most importantly, she suggests you need to figure out what your instructions to students are and give them to your students before you give them your character cards because you are going to completely lose their attention once they're studying their character and starting to think about how they're going to answer each other's questions. I think this sounds like such a fun activity. It would be a great thing to do in October. You can use it to introduce a lesson on mystery or on suspense, or you can use it um, in conjunction with like Poe or Sir Arthur Conan Doyle or Agatha Christie, any kind of author that, that builds in a lot of mystery, suspense, thriller type elements. All right, next up, I want to talk about students designing escape rooms. I have done some deep diving into the world of escape rooms, and I find it 
pretty fascinating, but also really time consuming. And what I figured out to be the fastest way to design an escape room that's fun, but doesn't take just hundreds of hours to put together is to create a digital escape room. And I have created a digital escape room template for your students to modify and tweak to cover whatever content in the creative ways that they want to cover it. And so in October, it could be a fun time to roll out these student escape room projects. Your students can cover any content with them. So you can think about, okay, what do I want my students to teach each other? Is it going to be like background on a period? Is it going to be some kind of writing technique? Is it going to be vocabulary, grammar? Whatever you're interested in having your students teach each other, break it up into chunks, give each group a chunk, and then have them design an escape room. And I highly recommend just use the templates that I already have created for you for free. You can grab them in the show notes. Basically, what you're going to see is a digital um, room, a slide that has a lot of different clickable elements. And when students click on those elements, they're going to be taken to these other slides where they can drop clues. So every group will customize theirs in a totally different way, send the link back to you, and then everybody in your class can play the digital escape room. Of course, there's a bit more to it, (laughs) but in the template you will see, and also I'm going to link to a full post giving you sort of an exact play-by-play if this is something you want to try. Okay, next up, let's talk about a Halloween twist on podcasting. Maybe you have been excited thinking about having your students create podcasts, but you haven't quite known where to fit them in, how to fit them in. This could be a really neat, very short project for October. You could spend maybe three days just dipping your toes in the world of podcasting with your students. So this is a chance to do some creative writing. You could do a scary story podcast. So imagine you're sitting in your classroom with the lights off, sort of passing a flashlight around from student to student. They're lighting up their face with that creepy upward pointing white light and telling a scary story, except you're going to do this with podcasts. They can be as short as you want or as long as you want. You can do one minute scary stories like super flash fiction, or you can do five minutes scary stories. And you're going to have your students write their scary story, record it using the incredibly simple platform Vocaroo, or even just record it on their phone or an iPad. And then you can have them design a podcast cover for their podcast, either in Canva or slides. Either way, it's quite simple. They're just going to be designing a square image that complements their podcast and then linking up the audio. Again, I have a post, a past post that walks you through every step of this. The tech really is quite simple. And then once your students have all created their spooky podcast, you can either kind of turn off all the lights and have a theme day in class, get a flashlight going, play some like low background music with with sort of creepy elements and get out some candy. Um, or you can let students grab their headphones and maybe go through a choice menu where you've got every single podcast linked up and you invite students to listen to four or five of them and give feedback to the podcast recorder. Okay, next up, spooky blackout poetry. This is one of my favorites. Blackout poetry is one of my favorite creative activities at any time of year, but at Halloween, it's just perfect. You can take a short story or an article that's about a topic with a little bit of a scary theme, so it has some um, suspenseful words or description or, you know, actions, the the weather is bleak, the lightning is cracking, the door is creaking. So you have all these kind of words that lend themselves to a Halloween theme. And then have students create blackout poems with Halloween-y, spooky type of illustrations. I have become quite sold on creating blackout poetry in Canva. I like just dropping a page of text into Canva, blacking out all the words that I don't want, and then I like overlaying my illustrations in between the words on the black right there in Canva. But of course, that's 
non-traditional. The more traditional method would be to give students Sharpies and have them create right on a page of old text or a page of old newspaper or magazine or just print, you know, take isolated pages from a Poe short story or an Agatha Christie novel, um, photocopy them for your students and have them create their blackout poetry right on that single page of text. It can be really interesting to see what a lot of different students do with the same page of a story because they'll pick such different words and create such different poems and then they'll get to see each other's. Next, I want to suggest experimenting with the writing maker space with a fall or Halloween theme in October. So you may remember I've had on Angela Stockman is a guest on the show, and she's the pioneer of the writing makerspace. She's the one, she's written three or maybe four books now, wonderful books and so many wonderful blog posts and Instagram posts about how to get started with the writing makerspace, how to take it to a deep level. And she shares this idea that for many students, it is so helpful in their writing process if they can see... Um, if they can make, if they can move things around physically before they ever start to write, they can make an argument, they can make a character, they can make a mood and that these, um, these physical processes can be so helpful in, in igniting their writing ability and, and helping them think through the structure, the characterization, the argumentative claim, the, the outline of what they want to create. And so if this idea intrigues you and you'd just like to get started with it, I think Halloween is a fun time to try it. You could have students create Halloween puppets and then write a dialogue between them. You could have them do doodling a creepy mood and then write a story that goes along with that mood. You could have them, um, you know, create a painting of a haunted house and then set a, a two minute flash fiction piece inside one room of the house. And for many students, being able to actually see what they're going to be creating in this way, being able to create it on paper first with art materials or string together a series of photos that's going to be their outline or, um, you know, choose three three videos and knit them together as inspiration. Just Just this idea that they are... They are creating with maker materials first, and then they are writing is going to be so helpful and inspiring to them. And I think, you know, Halloween provides a fun time to try it. And then if they're sold and you're sold, you can go forward and, and do it with other other types of writing besides Halloween creative writing. You can do it with argument. You can do it with, um, you know, practicing dialogue. You can do it with plays. You can do it with short stories. Okay, next I'm going to revisit a subject that I always love. That is to try poetry tiles for Halloween. I have created a set of these um, with different Halloween themed backgrounds and different digital poetry words they can move around like haunted and donuts and costume, candy, Halloween, neighborhood, dark, chocolate. Um, you can create your own or you can grab my kit. These poetry activities are really fun. They're always really fun for me to play with and make models for. And then I hear back from teachers that students are just delighted by the way they they create these poems that they love, whereas maybe at first they don't think of themselves as poets. But the fact that the poetry is already there and all they have to do is delete the words they don't want and move around the words they do want, it just kind of takes the fear out of it. It's a bit like the writing maker space. It's a bit like blackout poetry in these ways. It's like it just helps students get past that block and give them a little bit of creative constraint to help them feel inspired. And I love creating these sets for <laughs> any situation that I can really um, because I find them to be so much fun. Okay, next, I've been on my attendance question bandwagon a lot lately because it's the start of the year and I consider attendance questions to be one of the greatest ways to build community, build relationships, just kind of connect with students over something that's not 
necessarily class related for a minute or two every day. So attendance questions, if you haven't already heard me talk about them, are just this this process where at the start of class, instead of saying, okay, say here when I call your name, they give an answer to a question. So if you wanted to make your questions October themed, you might say, for example, okay, when I call your name, give your answer to the question, candy corn or popcorn balls? And then you're going to have a bunch of kids say candy corn and a bunch of kids say popcorn balls. And you're going to have serious feelings <laughs> about which one is really better and memories that come up. And you can always expand these attendance questions into quick debates or partner conversations or quick writing prompts, but it's a lot of fun. You can ask them things like, would you rather wear a costume every day in October or have everyone else you know wear a costume every day in October? Which do you think are better, Snickers or Reese's Peanut Butter Cups? What's the best scary movie of all time? Would you rather drink apple cider or a pumpkin spice latte? Would you prefer to go to a haunted house or go trick-or-treating? Just like little quick questions. They have to have quick answers because otherwise if you if you let 30 people answer them, it's going to take your entire class period. But if all they're saying is popcorn balls or candy corn, it's really quite quick um, and you can choose to expand it if you have the time. Next up, let's talk about the podcast Limetown. <laughs> I listened to the first three episodes of Limetown last year on the recommendation of many teachers and realized that it is way too scary for me. But just on the first episode, I was really intrigued and curious. And it wasn't until episode three that I got really scared and started Googling the podcast and trying to figure out if it was real. And I will not tell you the answer, so I don't spoil it for you. But um, the show is full of suspense. It's it's full of cliffhangers. It's very exciting and dramatic. And if some of your students are true crime junkies or really into horror movies, Stephen King fans, that kind of thing, they're probably going to love it. So in October, if you wanted to, you could introduce it as part of a choice board, or you could do like a single listening lesson with it, like use it to create a writing prompt. Or if you want to try podcast clubs for the first time, and again, you can go back and listen to a whole episode on podcast clubs a while ago if you're interested, um, Limetown could be an interesting one to put in there for the first few episodes. Again, it does get quite scary in episode three, and that's that's where I stopped listening. So if you're going to do like something quick, or if you're into, into the scary fiction world, then you could listen to the whole thing just to be sure that it would be okay in your podcast clubs unit with your older kids. Um, but it's, it's certainly an interesting premise. It is certainly full of surprises and I will leave it at that. Next up, Poe. Good old Edgar Allan Poe, pioneer of spooky writing. October is the perfect time to bring in a little bit of Poe. I am seeing so much Poe memorabilia in my social media feed lately. It's amazing. <laughs> so if you're into it, you can stop by a store like Michael's and find some fun Poe themed stuff. Do a little uh, decor and maybe a literary shelf in your choice reading library with Poe themed elements. Um, this is a great time for Poe. October is the perfect time. If you were looking to introduce some literary elements with a short story or you just have like a few days free and you need a filler in between units, try reading The House of Usher or The Raven or The Telltale Heart. You might do a spooky one-pager project with it. Or I have designed a very elaborate Poe escape room. This is this is one I've talked about on the podcast before, kind of shared my process in designing it. It took a very long time. <laughs> um, and that's, you could do one of your own or you could pick up mine and that would be a fun element in October. 
Okay, last but not least, I'm going to suggest that in this month is the perfect time to feature spooky reads in your first chapter Friday program. And you can decide how spooky you want to be, of course, based on the age of your kids. I don't read a lot of horror, and so I'm thinking of books like The Hunger Games and Scythe and Frankenstein and Dracula. Um, you could you could put a whole lineup of Agatha Christie. You could put in some sprinkle in some goosebumps just to give kids nostalgia for their elementary school experience. Um, I designed a little kind of display table tent for you that you can put in front of yourself and some little cards where students and other faculty members could could write a quick book review of their favorite creepy book and you could put them up on your bulletin board. So I'll go ahead and link that in the show notes. But this is the perfect time for spooky reads in your first chapter Friday program, in your book trailer Tuesday program, and um, of course displayed in your choice reading library and on your bulletin board somewhere nearby. So there you have it, my friend, a whole smorgasbord of creative options for this coming month. Mix and match them however you wish, and maybe add a bag of fun-sized Butterfingers to your desk drawer just to, you know, complement all these great Halloween-themed lessons. Thanks so much for joining me today to talk about Halloween and ELA. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative. Mm -hmm.